Well done. We can fix that in post. Welcome to Armchair Producers, episode 184. It's been a hiatus that we've had because Electric Ham Sandwich Studios was on the move and life likes to intervene as it so frequently does. But we are back. We are ready. We are raring. I am one of your hosts, George Terran, alongside the man, the myth, the Wayland Utani sponsored. Mr. Travis Croft, how are you, sir? I am fine and dandy, and we are building better worlds together. It is um, true. Nothing believe- going on under the surface. No suspicious quarantine laws being broken. You believe there are two new alien projects in the works right now? It just is terrifying. Um, <laughs> what they're going to do to it next? Uh, I am back. We are back. It's It was an exhausting three weeks. I did move house. I have been here about two and a half weeks now in the new studio. Um, in boxes. Be, in bo- is that, we, you might be, I don't think there are any boxes in this room anymore. Um, <laughs> she's remarkable, really. It's only just developed today. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's nice to be somewhere that has, uh, you know, actual heating has been uh, is suitable for human habitation. Unlike my uh, previous uh, <laughs> my previous home, uh, where the, uh, the flower, my co-host, <laughs> where the uh, the landlord had the, like heating. To... The uh, the landlord had refused to fix the heating for the past four months in God, the previous you had property. Heating? God, I didn't have heating. I used to get a slipper to the face. <laughs> Luxury, <laughs> um, and you know, it's just a, I, I'd like to tell you his name, but probably the most of our audience wouldn't know who he was. But they really the kicker was he's a very famous Australian sports person. Uh, so, you know, not short of a dollar, but, you know, short of humanity. So everyone knows um, sports personalities have not got a cent to rub together, I'm afraid. Oh, well, it depends who they are, really. Um, <laughs> in fairness, you know, like, uh, but this, this one in particular, I, I, I'd be fairly confident to say they're not short of a dollar. But mm. uh, we are back. We are, we are here now to talk to you about all the things you love, like, uh, Thriller mo- uh, horror thrillers from 20 Thanks, years ago. Uh, you know, uh, spy thrillers from 50 years ago. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's it's all relevant here. It truly is. Now, for those new to the show, welcome. And don't forget, you can join us on twitch.tv slash The Fried Brain. Armchair Producers is basically on every platform if you prefer to listen to us as podcast forms, Google and Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We are on facebook.com slash Armchair Producers. Um, Travis is at Evil Trav on Twitters, and I am at The Fried Brain on Twitter. Follow along, and we do take recommendations, except for get off the air. Not even God can stop us. We have proven that multiple times. And don't, don't, he has tried. He genuinely has. Um, I think the only one that we haven't had so far... Locusts? Um, uh, we, we, we haven't had blood raining from this guy. All frogs. Giant frogs! Um, we, we, okay did re- we did review Magnolia. Touche. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 we cut John's mustard there. Um, but yes, it's uh, it's mm. not to be back. There's been all sorts of things happening mm-hmm. uh, in, in the, the world of film over the last few weeks. Uh, and tech, yeah. uh, you don't work in tech anymore, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah. you have, you're an Apple man. Did you see the new Apple uh, VR headset? Yes, a measly $4,000. Uh, the U- US. Yes. Yes, four thousand US dollars, and what's it going to be? It's basically an iPod, just you know, floating wherever you look. By the looks of it, it's like, oh, you can have a virtual outdoors, or you could just go outdoors and not be attached to a wire, and save and it's got, four grand. And it's got a battery pack, which is super weird. Um... Yeah, it's the, the people are really pushing VR, and. I don't entirely understand why. Well, you know, the first so, one, the first so one. many of the pr- products is like, oh, it's like being outdoors. It's like, then just go outdoors if that's what you want. It's cheaper and healthier. I guess the, the thing is, it's like Apple were first to the really nail the smartphone. They were the first to really nail the portable music player. Like every, other people have done it, but nobody had done it properly. Mm. So, and obviously, forevermore, but like it'll just iPhone has that 
mm. you know dominant position there for such a long time mm. as a result of that uh, i guess yeah. they all want to be that person uh you know yeah. uh that that company again um if somebody can nail vr first then there's a lot of money to be made i don't think it's going to be this one because it's just too expensive it's expensive especially when you've got uh meta quest 2 coming out which was um much cheaper offering um but the the other thing is this this apple pro v uh it's is not vr it's ar it's augmented reality which yeah they're this is something that um, the. Do you remember the Xbox Halo, the Microsoft Halo thing from, like when? Was, uh, yeah, the, the Hololens. That's it. Yes. Um, they they kind of gave up on that as an idea of as as a customer retail customer thing because it was just such such an expensive product at the time, but apparently it got a bit of a interest in like the um, particularly in the medical factor because of that augmented reality they could overlay a skeleton structure and things like that on a person's body and you could kind of map and see and things like that and they did some interesting things with augmented reality uh, minecraft i remember from a few years ago so yes, i think i remember that yeah and i remember I, th I think that ai has some interesting properties but not at four grand like the idea of kind of having AR glasses that you can use for playing D&D &D rather than having to like buy all the expensive um, set this, uh, the locations and things like that. And having so much of that, you could just go AR and then have your figure in there. That That's awesome. But I'm not willing to pay four grand for US. Well, for that's the thing. It's, 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 they could get ahead of, you know, maybe this will be the start this kind of thing will be what's going to win it, but this product ain't going to win it. I no. have a, a, a VR headset. It's kind of fun, but mm. someone's got to figure out what to do with them first. You know what I mean? And all right, there are some technical, you know, work-based sort of uh, functions for these sort of things. Like you, you said medical and engineering mm. and military and stuff, but like mass consumer is really no reason to buy one right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know why I brought that up. We don't normally talk about VR here, but like it just seems I know you're an Apple it's man. An interesting and... concept, and you know, it's not every day that new tech gets announced. And don't worry, it's, it is a cool looking headset. I will pay that. It, it was does look cool. cool. Yeah, it does look cool. Um, other pieces of tech that have just been announced. There was uh, the State of Play PlayStation announcement, and they are doing a really, really rubbish add-on for the PlayStation Five, which. Is oh, a portable thing, yeah. Which, but you need an actual Wi-Fi connection to be able to connect, so it's not really portable. It's just so that you can free up your TV in the living room. Like, mm, no, people don't spend eight hundred and fifty dollars Aussie on a console, which is promoting itself as, oh, we do all our games four K and then playing them on a tiny little screen. No, that's that's it's, not. Um, it's, it's stupid. It's, it is a strange choice by someone who usually nails it. Should we go on to our more normal topic is our chain movie of a week and our other things. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have all the things. Chain movie of this week is, of course, chosen by George, and it is Identity. Yes. Connected tissue from last uh, last time's talk radio was John C. McGinley, um, and he is the connection into the James Mangold directed 19, uh, no, 2004? Was it 2004? 2003, Identity. Three, yeah. 2003, Identity, starring John Cusack and Ray Liotta, most notably. This is the first time you have ever watched this, if I'm right, yes? Uh, yes, I vaguely remember seeing one of these films you saw in the dying days of uh, video stores, and you're like, eh. You know, I don't really remember it coming out. Um, so I don't know how successful it was, uh, on its initial release. Um, but no, I, I certainly had not seen this before. Mm. Have you, is this the first time for you or is this one? No, uh, you're going I watched to... this when it first came out and, um, I remember being kind of impressed because it came out at that time when there was still that relatively fresh buzz of the idea of a, of a Shyamalan star twist on the tail. And this has sort of, uh, 
Shyamalan-esque twist to it. It's a bit more traditional kind of Alfred Hitchcock kind of twist at the end, I suppose. But I think it overall does it rather well. For those do, who do not know, stranded at a desolate Nevada motel during a nasty rainstorm, 10 strangers become acquainted with each other when they realize that they're being killed off one by one. I think that's a pretty good way of putting it without going into any spoilers for it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a really, really meaty description in IMDb if you want to read the whole thing. Um, yes, that's that's a bit much. Yeah, I'm not um, do that, but uh, Huggo, well done, sir. Well done. Or man. Or ha, to them. Uh, it is an, a... Uh, an interesting cast. Uh, I, I sat down the other night. I have to sometimes if I want to watch these, I have to watch the trailer first. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, you go, oh, I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a a who's who of B grade early two thousand stars. Um, yeah. You remember when Amanda Peet was kind of a yeah. name that almost uh, happened? Whole nine yards was her big hit. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so John Cusack. Ray Liotta, Amanda Peet, uh, Alfred Molina, Clay Duval, you previously mentioned John C. McGinley, Jake Busey, uh, mm -hmm. Rebecca De Mornay, mm -hmm. John Hawks is an John Hawks is a name you won't know, but you might recognize his face. For mm -hmm. me, I saw him straight away. I'm like, oh, he's the guy from the liquor store at the start of from Dust or Dawn. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're just going to end the sentence there. He's the guy from the liquor store. <laughs> That's not the guy from the liquor store. <laughs> um, the other name here is uh, you won't know, but you'll know her face is Holmes Osborne, who's in one of those guys is in heaps of stuff. Yeah, um, he was he was the, uh, Donnie Darko's dad. Yes. yes. Uh, so it's a it's an ensemble mm -hmm. uh, of of names and faces as like you know um, they they had a they stretched their budget pretty well in in mm -hmm. terms of faces you would know. Mm -hmm. I have. A different a different reaction to you in terms of this aside from the impressive cast i mm. thought this was a load of shit <laughs> like i thought this was a really really badly done film mm -hmm. um now it has a good rating indb gives it a 7.3 mm -hmm. 64 meta score mm -hmm. um i will quickly check the rotten tomatoes but uh you obviously thought it was pretty good but like this felt like it, i hadn't seen this i saw it at the cinema this is bargain basement Tarantino light meets yep. Shyamalan twist. Like yep. uh, I was already so this has a seventy five audience score by the way on Rotten Tomatoes, sixty three mm -hmm. on a Tomato Meter for critics. So it was well received. I don't know if this was better in two thousand and three when, as you sort of said, the the twist film was maybe a little bit newer and we were still kind of in Shyamalan hadn't completely shit the bed yet with his career. <laughs> um, but uh, I I mean. It starts off well enough, you know, with a motel setting and the, yep. the strangers all arriving in, in different ways. But the, the fact that it, it chose to introduce each, uh, uh, each you know, uh, person, each stranger, via a, a way of a flashback, and then, like, then sometimes a flashback within a flashback, mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of like, hang on a second, this is a little bit confusing and very awkward way of doing it. Um, you know, uh, at the same time as we have uh, sh scenes from another location where they're having a hearing yep. uh, for somebody, and you're like, okay, what the fuck's all this about? Um, and the, the 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 people starting to drop off one by one, as the as the uh, synopsis sort of describes there, mm -hmm. it was a little bit cliche for me. It was like, well, we've seen this all a million times, as you sort of said. It's oh. It's a hundred percent. I watching it again. It's sort of like, oh, yeah. I I now re I realize why I liked it when it first came out, and it was because at that point I was aspiring an aspiring young writer director. It's like, yeah, I could do this too. It, it feels like a student movie in so many ways, an homage student movie to much greater people. The, the 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 way that everyone kind of ends up at the same location it feels a little bit like we've watched two movies which lampoon that of clue and um yeah peter sellers one yeah 
Um, murder most horrid. No, not murder most horrid. Murder by I death. Um, and it's it's very quintessential whodunit style. There is a lot of that idea kind of thematic kind of feel to to old Hitchcock sort of things the the way that it's shot and the gritty grimy kind of look definitely brings into that era after Pulp Fiction just made Tarantino the biggest name in town everyone put their took took that idea and tried to try to do their own thing with it. it's like mm, nah doesn't work and the Shyamalan kind of twist of the story is like, it's always nice when a story tries to be intelligent, but you got to know what you're doing. And if you're going to try and do something surprising, you're probably not going to be able to really do that unless you're very skilled. If you're all you're doing is just taking from better people to amalgamate a movie. And that's what this is. There's, there's just, so like it, it's it's an everything soup where they just chuck a little bit in and go yeah it's, it's edible <laughs> there's, there's thriller elements there are horror elements there are road movie elements there are crime movie elements there you know your tarantino your Shyamalan, your hitchcock and you put them in a big pot and stir them around this yep. is this i mean this is written by the same person who wrote jack frost and jack frost 2 revenge of a mutant killer snowman um, uh, I don't know how the fuck they got Michael Keaton to be in one of those movies, but I think he was in one of them, but I could be wrong, but, um, he but, needs money for his farm. Um, but they were terrible, terrible movies. I have seen Jack Frost to revenge of a mutant killer snowman. Um, I saw a friend of a show, Shay, actually, believe it or not, um, who insisted on renting it, uh, from the video store. Uh, and, you know, I, I will not soon forget that insult. <laughs> this, in fact, is the first film produced by the writer Michael Cooney since Jack Frost to Revenge of a Killer Mutant Snowman, which he also directed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you have a look at this guy's work, you can predict that he is not somebody, I think, who has the ability of someone like Shyamalan who has gone on to significantly lesser things <laughs> um uh as his career has gone on but um he at one point in time had the ability to really nail those sort of twist the endings in ways in ways you didn't see coming uh and were deeply satisfying this this just didn't do it so i mean the start of it's okay i mean like i said there's the flashbacks and the contrived way they all end up at the at the actual hotel is okay people mm-hmm. start dying that's when it starts to get a bit cliche it starts to get a bit boring um where it really loses its way for me is the first of the big twists with involving alfred molina and the hearing oh yeah uh, i think i think we can say we don't have to give you a spoiler warning for a 20 year old film do we we're fine but there will be a spoiler warning for day of the jackal <laughs> a lazy 50 years full circle. <laughs> uh, so uh you know the idea that like it be revelation that all of this movie is happening inside the head of a serial killer mm-hmm. and each person at the motel represents one of his multiple personalities mm-hmm. You're like that is possibly the dumbest fucking thing i've ever heard mm-hmm. and it completely cheapens the previous hour of the film or so that's happening like so i haven't actually been watching real characters they are figments of someone's imagination this Del- is the this is the, the late 90s early noughties version of it was all a dream yeah. Um, and that's incredibly cheap. Yep. Uh, and I can't believe that all the reviewers like, oh, it's a great twist and no one saw it coming and, and I could go with it, it's fine. But I'm like, why the fuck would I go with it? It's terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, and why the fuck once I mean I get it fair enough, I guess what maybe you go with it. But why the fuck do I still go flashing back to what happens at the motel? But I know they're not real people. Why do I care what happens to any of them if they're not real people? Because they are inside this killer. I, I don't get it. Like, why should I care? Like, it's one thing to have the whole story and then give me the twist at the end going, aha, they were all serial killer, multiple personalities. That's, yeah. Okay, I'll pay that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. But I'm like, to tell me about two thirds of the way through the film and then ask me to care about what happens to these characters that I've spent the previous hour with who I now know 
yeah. just in someone's head. Like, who should I be cheering for? Who should I be rooting for? Is, is who's the good guy here? Who's the bad guy? You know, like, and that changes multiple times as well mm-hmm. throughout yep. the story in, in again, completely tried and unoriginal and boring ways. And there may um, well be some people out there who listen to this. So, hi. <laughs> um, but they may look at it and go, oh, well, what's it, what, how's that any different to when we see the hero lying dead on the ground, dying at the start of a, start of a movie, and then it flashes back? It's like, well, the difference is because, for one, they're probably going to survive if they're the, the main hero and we know who they are. And two, it's about that journey. But this is not that that narrative style this is being told to us that it's happening kind of coincidentally at the same time so it's not as if sort of like oh we're seeing these people die off and by the end of the the motel the good person one remaining good personality or one remaining bad personality is going to be that left over and then the the result from the judge is going to come down innocent or guilty and it's going to be ah oh, the guilty person got away with it how horrible is that or the innocent person got um got vindication and they're now cured or whatever that's that's not this story that's not what they're going for that would have been way more interesting it gets worse though i mean it just gets worse in the sense that we have the twist of him the personalities mm-hmm. then we get told you should now still be interested in what happens to those personalities mm-hmm. you should care about amanda pete surviving um I, <laughs> nope. yeah yeah spoiler alert i don't nope. um and then there's the fucking revelation at the end that the killer was the kid like that john c mcginley's son was like somehow going around killing all these people but travis we've never seen a murderous child before ever i mean i know that it probably pinks that little bit from the omen but <laughs> I don't know the Omen has its problems, um, but there are some genuinely shocking parts of the of Omen, which uh, I think hold up pretty well. Yep. Other parts, not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least, you know, it, it foreshadows. You know, you can't just go, twist, it's somebody you never would have suspected. It's, it's you know, some guy who's hiding in the floor the whole time who we've never seen. We've never you seen know. or heard of this person before. No. Uh, or, and then the idea that it's him. And that then there's, there's the scene at the end where... Alfred Molina's like the court appointed psychologist or something yep. is driving the serial killer to, to jail with no security, even though he's been found like insane or something and like not criminally responsible, but like they still don't give him any security when they take him to jail. I'm like, fuck, that is stupid. This movie is stupid. Uh, I, I'm like, this is, I don't know where James, James Mangold has really turned it around. Yeah. Um, in his career, because well, well, this we'll, is not at uh, the end of the month. <laughs> well, 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 maybe. Like, I mean, he still made some very good films in his career, and you can't take that away from him. That's true. Before he made this, he made three, two decent films and one film. Uh, well, this is his fifth feature. Um, he, his original feature is 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 a film called Heavy from 1995, which uh, I have not seen, and looks like. Uh, you'd be struggling to find a copy mm-hmm. of. Uh, but Liv Tyler's in it. Um, then we have uh, Girl Interrupted. We also have uh, Copland uh, mm-hmm. in, in the late 90s. Both of those are solid movies. Mm-hmm. Um, Kate and Leopold, uh, which we have talked about in the past. I think, when it, Favorite I, think when it, I think I think when it comes to plucky young advertising executives, this is very much a Citizen Kane of plucky young advertising executive films. I'm sorry, Travis, did you say plucky young advertising executive? I think it is, yes. Oh. <laughs> that is. That, we need that on a T-shirt. <laughs> Bucky, Bucky, uh, aspiring Bucky Young Advertising Executive. Um, uh, and, you know, look, I mean, for, it wasn't a great and film. After this, the award-winning Walk the Line. Walk the Line, which is a really great film. Free tender humour, which mm-hmm. I did consider uh, being our film for next week. It won't be. Mm. Um, but it's a great film as well. Night and Day, I haven't seen. Uh, Wolverine. Okay, let's best not keep moving. Um, the, Logan, Ford, and Ferrari are mm-hmm. great films. Yeah. So he's done some really good work. Uh, this is one of the lower lights in his uh, Uber, yeah. I'd say. And it's it's one of those ones that also I for some reason any time I think of John Cusack, I always think, oh, he was great, and he was. 
solid, really solid in gross point blank and high fidelity. And he was pretty good and say anything. But then I look at the rest of his movie career and it's like, wait, why, why do I hold John Cusack with that instant level of... Oh, come on, being John Malkovich as well, it's a kind of a pretty decent film. It's, it's uh, a pretty film, but how is he in it? Like, I don't pretty remember, remember pretty him good. in it. Oh, he was the main guy in it. Yeah, but everyone's was just John Malkovich, and John but Malkovich no, he's, feels he's the show. But he actually, well, so it would be obviously, but like I still thought he was pretty good in that. I mean, you go back to the 80s as well and stuff like uh, Say Anything. Um, yeah. You know, that's, a, that's a classic uh, of the 80s, if you're so inclined. Um, but then he's got a lot of very middling things, is my thing. Like, I kind of enjoy Runaway Jury. It's fine, but it's kind of John Cusack doing John Cusack. Um. It, I, I don't understand. I, I want to like the guy. I instantly want to like the guy. I want to like what he's in. But especially in the last few years, it's like, okay. It's been a long time since he did anything of note, in fairness. Um, yeah. I, I think he's, I, I personally, I think he's deeply miscast in this film. Yeah. I think his sweet spot is rom-coms, really, you know, like comedies. Uh, though, honestly, there's a film in his, in his, in his, that nobody's seen. It's called Max. If you haven't seen it, he plays an art dealer and Noah Taylor plays Hitler. Ah, oh, yes. That's a good movie. That's that is a fantastic movie. movie. But I think that's all for me. That's all about Noah Taylor's performance. Yes. Um, more so than John Cusack, but John Cusack's fine in it. Yeah. Um, and no, 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 look, probably very difficult for you to see it because I don't know where you, I saw it at a film festival. I don't even got a release anywhere, but it's a great film if you can find it. Um, but this is not like an action hero. No. Yeah, and he did films like this. He did 1408, which was a um, Stephen King yeah. adaptation as well. Um, the last thing I think I saw him in was Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Um, yeah, so he's he's um, he, he's seen better t- better days and yeah. the work he does these days. Um, but I, I don't think he was particularly well cast in this role. No. He was a name. Ray Liotta looks reasonably comfortable doing this kind of shit. Um, it's it's kind of schlocky. But then again, Ray Liotta was never above doing schlock. Yeah. And, I mean, come on. His his last movie was Last Time's Cocaine, Cocaine Bear. Cocaine Bear. Uh, so he was exciting in that. Clay Duval was really out of place in this one. I don't yeah. know what she was doing there. Amanda Peet did what she did reasonably well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought Jake Busey playing the prisoner, I guess, um, was kind of doing peak Jake Busey. Yeah, it was sort of like okay. He w- he went through a bit of a phase of just doing these sort of like villainous like characters, um, and you know. But for me, he he shines in uh, the Frighteners or Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers, great fun. Just like getting that really cool looking violin out of the box randomly. It's like, oh yeah, this will <laughs> this will appease all of those troops that are seeing their friends die horribly. Just give them a violin. <laughs> mm, fascism, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> Look over here. Look over here. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it's a good film. I I, I wish that uh, no, most people didn't get that. I should read the book one day. Yeah. I didn't like this film. I'm sorry. I thought this was of its time. Mm-hmm. Um. It was a pretty weak story of a twist. Was mm-hmm. well, I guess not obvious. I give it that much. I just didn't like. It just kind of really mm. cheapened the whole experience for me. It was an interesting time capsule. Now to realize that this is twenty years old. Yeah, yeah. Whew. That's 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 a little unsettling, but mm-hmm. that's that's the way of it. Ugh. That's half my life ago. <laughs> Half luxury. Um, luxury. Uh, I, was, I, I'd finished uni, was working full time at the time, and I'm like, I have absolutely no memory of what I was doing when this film came out. Um, that, that's that is <laughs> that's a lot. Because, that's, that's because you were working. <laughs> that's what you've got to look forward to, kids. Uh, so that's yeah, it came out uh, April 25th, 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, Happy it was twenty in, years identity to a movie I enjoy. <laughs> would have been in I would have been in Russia at the time. That's where I was when this came out. I actually went to I went and saw a, a couple of films in Russia. 
mm-hmm. uh, one of which was Tears of a Sun. So I figured I didn't really need to know what was happening with if, oh, uh, Bruce which... Willis, Monica Bellucci one. Yeah, like <laughs> I didn't think it really mattered what people were saying because uh, I couldn't understand the Russian. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Tears of a Sun is not what we're talking about. Maybe one day we will. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to say about identity? No, nope, I'm done. I'm done. You have the keys, sir. Beating. Where are you taking us? Uh, we are going to follow John Cusack. Oh. Uh, and, and this is actually a request from the audience uh, for, we see we take requests, mm-hmm. even on a Shane film. So mm-hmm. uh, I was talking to Michelle, friend of the show, mm-hmm. one of our few audience members <laughs> who watched the live stream. Uh, <laughs> and she recommended this one personally, because believe it or not, you're going to be shocked. Prepare to be shocked. Okay. Put your prepare to be shocked face on. I have never seen this film before in its entirety. That film is 1997's Con Air. Seriously? Never seen it. Wow. Oh, and that gives me a great opportunity to still possibly take John Malkovich as the next connection. Or Nicolas Cage or Steve Buscemi. Put the uh, back in the box. Um, there's lots so of... Happy. Lots of... Dave Chappelle's in this, believe it or not. Uh, yeah. So, um, or, you know, everything went or, back. Uh, I always thought this was a Michael Bay film. But no. Apparently not. Uh, directed by Skyman, Simon West, written by yeah. Scott Rosenberg. It just sort of felt so Michael Bay-ish. Um, yeah. But it's not. So uh, John Cusack plays one of the leads in this film. Uh, <laughs> and so there you go. I've never it seen it. It is available any... on Prime Video for hire. And it's available to stream on Disney+. Plus. Disney+, Plus, a service I have cancelled because... Nothing well, I, is on I, there. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> I, I have considered I have considered cancelling it a few times because the amount of times you just skip right over it and go to the next one because I'm like, it's got nothing. It's not Marvel or Star Wars. And, <laughs> um, and they haven't been... Anyway, that's another conversation. Uh, that is Con Air next week. Mm-hmm. Back to, stick it back, you know, back in time to the 90s. Uh, somehow I missed this one. <gasps> I think I already know where we're going to be going. Lots of options. Lots so of options. tempting. Oh, there's so many good options off of Con Air. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. So, um, Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, should we keep moving and go to something a little bit more contemporary? Yes, let's do it. Let's take to the okay. air. Let's talk about air. So, this yeah. is the available now to stream on Amazon Prime if you are a customer of theirs, which yeah. I am. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, and Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, romp. Ben Affleck is back in the director's chair, something he has shown an unswerving ability to do well. Mm-hmm. Um, Academy Award winner of, of, of well, my no, exactly oh, yeah. director, but yes, uh, yes. for Argo, um, a, written by Alex Converi, who I am not familiar with. This is his first and only credit. Mm-hmm. Um, this is follows the sto- history of shoe salesman. Sonny Vaccaro, and how he led Nike in its pursuit of the greatest athlete in the history of basketball, Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sonny Vaccaro is played by Matt Damon. Matt uh, Damon. His, his boss, uh, Rob Strasser, played by Jason Bateman. Yep. Their boss, the founder of Nike, Phil Knight, played by mm-hmm. Ben Affleck himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Michael Jordan's mum, Dolores, played by the one and only Viola Davis. Howard White, who works at Nike as well. I don't exactly know what he does, but he plays by Chris Tucker. Yep. Um, you got Jane Moore in here as well. Um, Chris Messina, you might recognize his face from stuff. Uh, Marlon Wayans pops Barbara, up at one point. Barbara Sukoa, who I only know because she was in 12 Monkeys, the TV show. Oh, I've forgotten that happened. <laughs> that was a um, oh. And I have to say, Mm. I um a couple of things. One, I'm not a particularly big fan of Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if you got into the basketball craze in the late nineties, or you were too young, or oh, no. that was that was my that was my sport. Um, and I certainly was. You can see my coffee table is actually covered in basketball cards. I used to collect them. Like mm-hmm. I was where all my money went when I was a teenager at high school. Um, was wasted w- on w- basketball cards. Um. Um, there is actually a Michael Jordan card on that that table. Um, I, I lacked them all on. Um, and I was I was not a big Michael Jordan fan. I was not a big Nike fan. If you're talking about a mm. corporate brand, some people really 
get fucking serious about it. Like sneaky collecting is a massive big deal now. Um, and I think uh, I, 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 well, I may have owned Nike shoes over time. It was never something I was particularly interested in. But mm. this film, I was never a Chicago Bulls fan for that matter. Fuck the mm. Bulls. Um, <laughs> my team doesn't exist anymore. I was a Supersonics fan. Um, Supersonic? They don't exist anymore? They haven't existed for like 20 years. What? They moved what? into Oklahoma City. What? Yeah, no, it's how they work in the US for sports. The team's just up and moved to other, other cities. And, well, uh, it's a bit like, like, you know, it's not what happens in the AFL a few years ago for com- country, uh, you know, cities going, oh, you know what? We're going to move this team to somewhere else. <laughs> they've done it a couple of times in, yeah. in Australia, but, it, but we're not anywhere near like the US market where mm. teams move quite regularly. Um, I think the Oakland Athletics baseball team are moving to Las Vegas. Um, or something like that. Um, Why not? Anyway, so, but this is a fucking great film. I think this might be the best film I've seen this year. Um, what I did would, you make of it? I would agree. I, I loved it. Um, I think it was a little heavy on the, uh, sort of like r- member berries of products and things mm-hmm. like that. And some of the music, but overall, I don't think it was terrible. Um, I don't think it really ruined the movie for me. The performances was solid. Matt Damon is pretty consistently a solid, if not great, performer. Ben Affleck is a very, very competent director. I really enjoy his work behind the camera, and he's a he's fine in this role. He's entertaining. They he work he knows what level this movie needs to work at, where it's not violently accurate to the truth. Like there's um, a bit of information about sort of like um, the Air Jordan name, and they they subtly play both of those off um, within well, the movie. You know, and- it's a good point. There apparently there is some consternation about who much historical debate about who came up with the Air Jordan name. The mm-hmm. filmmakers decided the hand of a matter as delicately as possible, portraying with David Fork and Peter Moore each came up with the name separately by sheer coincidence. Yeah. So I think that was a good way of doing it, and it do, it added a little bit of brevity to it. Um, uh, shit, what's his name? Um, uh, Chris Tucker, his character was enjoyable, and it's funny seeing Chris Tucker as a as he's aging because he does seem to be kind of just leaning into that a little bit more. He doesn't do too much in the way of acting. Anymore. You don't see a lot of him. He's a big star there for a while. There's Rush yeah, Hour films. He's and very stuff, selective but... about what he does. Um, so this is his first it... proper acting role in since 2016. Wow. And only his second since 2012. Wow. Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't work much. He does. I guess he seems he doesn't need to. But um, every single one of them, even uh, Matthew Mayer as uh, Peter Moore, they all seem to know what what movie they're in and just just the right line of this is a historical piece that some people are really going to care about at the same time it's an entertaining piece i think they do a fantastic job at making you care about something it really doesn't matter like i i told you not a michael jordan fan no i i not that i think he's overrated i mean there's let's not get into basketball here the guys obviously was a genius at the sport and Arguably, probably almost beyond arguing, the greatest player in that sport of all time. One of the greatest sports people in any sport of all time. Like, the guy was dominant. Yeah. I just, I didn't enjoy watching because he was so fucking good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, and no one else had a chance. Like, uh, it made it boring. Yeah. It was almost boring. Like, I just, and it was just so, everyone loved Jordan. So I was like, the, I was the iconoclast. He was like, eh, not Jordan, not for me. Um, but like, I don't, I don't care about him. I don't care about the basketball team he played for. I don't care about the brand he signed for. I have no great love for Air Jordans, which some people take very seriously. Oh, yeah. Some of some of them are worth, you know, a, a great deal of money these days, vintage shoes and stuff. Never I always thought the idea of collecting sneakers was ridiculous. Um but you know, <laughs> uh obviously, you know, you can be into one of your I, I kind of collect records, so that's kind of ridiculous too. Yeah. Um so but somehow I care about this story. I care mm-hmm. about his characters. Yeah, and you should note Michael Jordan is not really in this movie. No, he's it's sort it's of there. body double essentially. Um, he was not involved in the making of this movie. He's only had a couple of requests that um, 
the character of Howard White, who apparently is a friend of his, be involved in in the story. And he requested Viola Davis play his mum, and like she fucking kills it. Because she is she is one of my favorite actresses working today because she just knows how to use her energy in such an efficient way like the conversation that um she and matt damon have um towards the end where they're talking about the royalties on the shoes and just her just sitting there just listening to him just like yep i'm right now you you could see her she was in exactly the same mindset as when a four-year-old is debating i want to have more ice cream Mm. (laughs) And, and she plays it perfectly and it's brilliant Look, and like I don't obviously I don't know I'm I, it's been not being a massive fan of Jordan I've never mm. looked into his story a great deal. There's a story that probably could be told. Um, mm. uh, it probably maybe be tempting considering this film is being reasonably successful. I think. Um, but like whether she was like that or not, but what a fucking genius mm-hmm. to actually ask for a percentage because as we saw in his film, it was something that wasn't done at the time. Oh yeah. Uh, and the story is, it's in the trivia here somewhere, but apparently Michael Jordan makes like $400 million of like passive income, um, every year just from like, not just because his name's on the shoes, um, you know, which is kind of nuts. It's a little bit like when George Lucas, uh, took a lower salary, I think for a piece of the merchandising on Star Wars. I think that worked out okay for him. I'm not sure. Uh, no, that was, um, Alec Guinness. Alec Guinness. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I think Lucas got a piece of a merchandising. I think Alec Guinness got points on the film. Mm. Either but way, but they, but they way, both yeah, smart they, moves. <laughs> smart smart moves in the end because they worked out okay. Um, so I, I guess that's the real genius of this for me. Is like I don't care about any of the people involved. I don't care about the company. I don't care about the product, but I care about the story and the yeah. characters are fucking brilliant. And I think I mean you you mentioned Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. They don't share a lot of screen time, but look, those guys still uh, work really well together. Mm-hmm. And I think it's one of the great tragedies of the last 15 years is he never directed any of the DC films he was involved with. That mm-hmm. Batman film he was going to do for a long time, but decided he didn't want to. Yeah, Fuck, I would have loved to have seen him direct yeah. the Batman movie he was in. I mean, like, sorry, Snyderheads. He's twice the director Zack Snyder is. Um, the Lee. Easily. Come not on. Even, not in the same league. Um, but the real unsung hero, I think, is Jason Bateman. He doesn't yeah. have a whole lot of screen time. He doesn't have a whole lot to work with. He's not, like, killing jokes, but no. he has a couple of good lines. And I think he ejects a real a real lovely energy into the role he's doing there. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah, he's, he's a wonderfully grounded performance. And it makes me want to check out, like, Ozark and things like that because I really only typically associate Jason Bateman with more of the comedy stuff, which is kind of what his bread and butter really was. But he... He serves it with a very straight bat here. He is understated. He doesn't play up. He's not playing a character. He's playing a real person. Maybe that kind of restriction helps him kind of internalize it, but it just does really well. The um, conversation he has with um, Sonny about, um, I understand what you do, but you didn't think about the consequences of, I have a child and I'm going to keep doing this because this brings my child joy, which brings me joy. That's a great little monologue that he delivered. Fantastic display. Really wonderful. I, I think he's, oh. he's like, I know he's been in and out of movies over the last 20 years since, <laughs> you know, um, what was his big hit? The, the one that it really was. Oh, the rest of development. <laughs> um, but like, I, I, I don't know. I, I know I haven't seen Ozark either, but I understand that was kind of his breaking bad. Mm. Um and like I I'd be fascinated to see if he goes on to do some really interesting more yeah uh, dram- dramatic work of it sort of because I think like as I said this role isn't just about getting last he does get a couple mm-hmm. but I think he builds another lot more I really so I think the performances yeah. are across the board stellar mm-hmm. they the the they make you the story is brilliantly written to the point where like I said we care about something I don't I don't fucking care about yeah. you make an excellent point about the music though we found it quite intrusive yeah um like i kind of go like just like just, just, just off the top of my head i'm looking here which is not off the top of my head sorry uh <laughs> money for nothing blister in the sun uh the message uh by uh grandmaster flash rock the casbah um in a big country 
Axel mm. F, ain't nobody, ain't nobody, um, can't fight this feeling by Ario Speedwagon. Um, this, Genesis, especially it, the time at the time, the by, music uh, is so intrusive, especially at the, at the start of the movie, um, where it starts off. I was thinking, oh, am I going to be looking at something along the lines of the Tetris movie where it had that kind of fun really good music in that but it wasn't overly intrusive it was it informed on the style of movie that we were watching for tetris whereas this just feels a little too heavy-handed and we've talked about this excessive use of music quite quite recently as well in other movies that we've watched where it's like ah oh, i love this mo uh, song it was guardians of the galaxy volume three just yes. so much it was over the top um and it, unnecessary it nailed it with tetris like tetris did have a lot of cool music in it i like that soundtrack but like mm -hmm. it didn't actually it kind of fit more as this one kind of sat almost became over the top and you're like fuck how much money have they got to spend on licensed music here like jesus yeah. christ this wouldn't have been cheap you, you start oh. worrying about like oh i mean how did you afford this guys especially 80s music at the moment it has never been more popular it's it's oh. a, a, a true renaissance. Everyone's going back to it. All these bands are touring again because people are finding all this wonderful music in their uh, in these movies, and people are rediscovering the '80s stuff. It's not cheap, ladies and gentlemen. It just it's, it was probably it didn't need to be there. That was just no. a short and short they, long. They, they I don't think it half this... of the music out of this movie, and it would have been better for it, and they wouldn't have felt it. A couple of songs here and there is fine, but like uh it, it was over the top it was like yeah. it was really too much and it did start to i think take away somewhat from from the story and the film you're like oh god what else are they fucking gonna get fuck bruce springsteen you know? <laughs> um uh, that doesn't at the end of the day though that is a very minor complaint which i mean uh about i think a really really enjoyable film like i, I said i think for me it might be the best film i've seen this year and that really isn't a statement about air that is a statement about the quality of what has sort of come out in the yep. last 12 months or last, the last six months of this year yep. at the cinemas and uh on streaming i mean i don't get to go to the cinema that much because life um yep. and you know i don't live that close to a cinema believe it or not uh i have to drive to one um oh, but what was me um but it, it it's not been a great year, I think, for for really high quality film for me. So I yeah, no, the yeah. Very, yeah, and so we, it, oh, sorry, yeah, I was just gonna say we've got not really much in the way of innovative innovative movies that are not based on prior existing franchises coming out for the next three months because we've got Indiana Jones coming out, which has got very mixed reviews and response um you've got the flash which has started getting some early reviews and people are kind of giving it sixes sevens eights so it's middling which on the dc scale isn't too bad um <laughs> and then we've got um there's spider-man into the spider-verse which a lot of people are saying oh it's more of the the first one which is great but it doesn't really end because it's part one of two so what do you expect? We've gone through Lord of the Rings. We've gone through Matrix. We've gone through plenty of trilogies where the middle one doesn't finish. So get used to it, folks. That's what <laughs> we live in now. There's not much originality. So this is an original film. Yes. This is kind of based on existing knowledge. Kind of probably we know who Michael Jordan is. We know who Nike is. But, like, it's, it's an interesting story, well told, and... You know, um, Quentin Tarantino's gotten some fuss recently because he's kind of stuck the boots into a lot of streaming stuff. We <clears> talked <throat> about it, I think, the last time we did the show. We did um, mm -hmm. Chris Evans, the Anna Armas film, mm -hmm. Ghosted, Ghosted um, and how bad that was. And Cookie this, got a movie. It's what we're kind of up against now. So it's a long-winded way of saying it's really, really good. Re not It's really good, but it's not life-changingly good. The reason I think it's the best film of the year is because it's been a pretty cruddly cruddly year in terms of movies so um, in, a, in a sea of melodrama and averageness air source 
pretty much <laughs> <laughs> nicely done should we move on to something a little bit more contemporary yes <laughs> a little bit more contemporary 50 year old movie <laughs> uh, for those who were not listening to the last show naughty naughty mm -hmm. um we have tried to get a little bit more structure to the show mm. have a little bit of fun with the third film every week mm -hmm. and try and pick a film that came out roughly this week 10 20 30 40 50 years ago and we are going to spin a wheel mm -hmm. to figure out which 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 time period we will pick and this film came out roughly 50 years ago for the week we recorded our last show yes um and this is a highly rated film from 1973 Based the on after, Frederick Forsyth novel. Forsyth novel. Who took you did not take points in the film. Had the option, chose not to. <laughs> um, in the aftermath of France allowing Algeria's independence, a group of resentful military veterans hire a professional assassin codenamed Jackal to kill President Charles de Gaulle. Uh, it says a 7.8 on IMDb, a 80 meta score, mm -hmm. starring... Actually, I don't think anybody I've ever heard of is in this film. Lies. You know who Derek Jacoby is? Do I? Which one Surely is he? He was in Much Ado About Nothing, the Kenneth Branagh movie. Oh, wow. <laughs> Trust me, I've done the best I could to delete that from my memory. <laughs> but yes, I have I have seen he was in Gladiator. Movie. Shut up. <laughs> he was in Gladiator and he was in Gosford Park as well, which are both good yes. films, and I have seen them. I'm not saying I've never seen any of these guys before. Mm. I'm, I just like I didn't recognize any of them. When you look at their names, you're like, nope, I uh, don't know who these people are. They're not. So I they were famous. Edward 50 Fox, because he's a quintessentially British. And I love how, aside from maybe the one head, um, sort of like main uh, investigator whose name I can't remember now off the top of mine, um, everyone seems to be, even though they are all in France. Everyone speaks with a very English accent. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and that's, a, the, that's the delightful thing about this era of movies is like everyone who is a hero speaks English. Anyone who doesn't speak English is either a nincompoop or a villain. Villain, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, get, well, I mean, apparently they wanted to just, um, have an American star. In it. They probably looked at Robert Redford or Jack Nicholson. But the, uh, the director wanted to stick to British actors because that makes more sense for a French f a film set in France. So <laughs> essentially, the story of the film is there is the, um, a, um, a, a, a sort of a, a fifth column of uh, French military veterans, the OAS, I think they're called. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Um, and they are pissed off at De Gaulle, granted Algeria their, their independence from France. Um, and they want to kill him as revenge for that, uh, that sort of insult to, you know, France and its honor. Um, they, the start, the start of a film, <laughs> you know, the idea of any French honor, you know, 20 years after they fucking surrendered in the first, second world war, like, fucking, <laughs> I mean, you know, cheese eating surrender monkeys, these guys, um, <laughs> they try to, they try to kill the girl by machine gunning his car. At the start of a film, I realized that at that point in time, the 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 network is disbanded or attacked by the the, the for French uh, state and police. Mm -hmm. the, the remaining the remains of the OAS decide the best way forward to get rid of uh, De Gaulle is to hire a professional hitman, <laughs> and they do so by hiring the Jackal, played by Edward Fox, mm -hmm. um, who is a is a Brit British uh, assassin, or it's insinuated he has a British accent. Everybody in the film assumes he is British, but at the end of the film, they're like, oh, is he really British? Uh, who is he? Uh, we never actually learned his real nope. name. Nope. Uh, and the film follows his preparations mm -hmm. uh, in the effort to, to you know, kill De Gaulle, mm. uh, including things like procuring documents, getting some of the custom make his weapons for him, um, that you sort of thing. Or purely for his own ends, he's he's a um, quite a ruthless, meticulous, presented assassin. Very much so. Um, what a, yeah, this is a this is a film. It is two hours and twenty three minutes long, and I think we've talked about this in the past. When we've talked about films from this period, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the word for the pacing of his film is languid. Um, um, it, I would go further and say Day of the Dead original version. This is shambling zombie. It's so slow. And it's in, in complete polar opposite to Air, which overuses music. There's really not much in here in this movie to kind of keep the energy going or anything like that. This is a very quiet movie. It is. And there are parts of it I like. But I, I think it's actually interesting to watch someone like this to actually have a film that follows the assassin. The assassin's the yes. protagonist. Yes. Um, and for those who are curious, yes, the 1997 Bruce Willis film, The Jackal, was a loose remake of this, I think. Um, they wanted they to actually call it that. Use certain elements. They weren't allowed to specifically call it Day of the Jackal or anything like that. It was like, mm. and it's inspired by the yeah. Film. Um, and it's I don't think it's it, I haven't seen that film, so I well mm. most of it anyway. Um, it is very slow, but I, I like I said, I like the idea we're following kind of a bad guy as our protagonist here, and we're not seeing them. It's not like um. Like, oh, they're uber, super evil and they're moustache twirling, like, Whoa! and mm. just seeing, you know, super evil. They're like, he's just, he's a professional. Yeah. And seeing how a professional would go about preparing for and trying to complete this task is an interesting story. Mm-hmm. Like you say, it, it doesn't have a lot to it to keep us kind of interested, to drive the plot forward. Mm. It just sort of meanders along towards the end of a film. Mm-hmm. And there's not a lot of action. Or, nope. you know, there's no not Which is, pieces. Mm, it's fair, considering this is supposed to be the story of an assassin that is invisible to the world. It's not as if you're going to be able to have fight sequences, action, car chases and things like that. And suddenly he disappears and no one knows or there's anything about him. This way he is able to be invisible. But that can be kind of boring. A little bit. Um, at times, it really kind of slows to a crawl. And there are parts of his film that kind of, so, um, you know, he nicks off to Italy a couple of times for different stuff, you know. Uh, um, he gets involved with a woman at a, at a hotel in southern France and then follows her back to her place and, kills her <laughs> stuff to steal her car and and you're just like uh is, did this subplot need to happen like no. did they have cut, cut this out like there's also <laughs> stuff in there where you're like that's really fucking dumb like yep. the name jackal is basically based on what we think is well maybe not his real name but mm-hmm. one of his assumed names like, yeah it's like his initials for the character they 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 think they locate the real uh, the, the person who he is. Yeah, uh, I forget the actual name. Um, and the name Jackal Jackal yeah. in French is like the French version of the first three letters of both his first and surname of his yeah. assume, which we later find out isn't actually his real identity anyway. Yeah, but he did use the passport or the identity of this person mm-hmm. at some point. So. Why would a really fucking good professional assassin choose to use a name that can be linked back to one of his assumed identities? That doesn't sound like something someone who knows what they're doing would do. Why don't you just think leads them yourself, on, on a on a wild goose chase in a cold cold case? You know, if it's call like, yourself the fucking elephant or something, and you're not, you know, oh well, it's not really based on anything, right? Like, yeah. um, it, it's. It didn't make a lot. That part was like that's stupid. Yeah. Um, that said, I didn't hate it. I it was of its time. I think is an, the important thing to note. It's not aged well. Um, parts of it haven't. Parts of it haven't. Like yeah, I like that it takes us time with things and it doesn't mm-hmm. have to constantly beat you over the head with action set pieces, a la Ghosted, which every twenty minutes you need to have. You know, an explosion, a car chase, a fight scene, mm-hmm. a shootout. out. This thing is just sort of unfolds in front of you. Mm. It just kind of unfolded a little quicker. <laughs> mm. 
the the other thing that uh, the movie that I was kind of thinking and sort of hoping that it was gonna sort of like later on in form was heat of the you know in that movie we're seeing the two sides of two professionals working and we see the lifestyle of both of them and the the bad guy in heat has got an overall a much healthier lifestyle compared to the good guy of al pacino who's he's a dick he's an asshole he's horrible he's a bad father and all sorts of stuff um this movie if we had gotten more time to actually learn about this other investigator who's the best investigator on the french force seeing how he works and seeing his meticulous so like pr pure professional manner as the opposite of the jackal that would have given us at least an opportunity to go through and have more of that general life engagement where the 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 jackal has no known associates or friends or anything like that they're all people incidental people that he meets along the way that he just uses they are tools to him and um edward fox plays the jackal in that very very sterile manner with his interactions it's almost um a little bit um uh the talented mr ripley where he's just, like, taking on this persona to move on and to, to better himself and move on and we see tiny little little moments of the investigator on the other side where it's like mm. but we never actually get an idea of who he is or how he's why he's the best investigator because he just he's he's sigourney weaver in galaxy quest that's <laughs> going i repeat what the computer says <laughs> and then he's just repeating what other people tell him it's like, why are you the best investigator why show me he is, he does he saves the day in the end um the the finale seemed a little rushed in the end i mean i like the way it was set up uh then there were like a callback at the you know to the meeting his meeting with a forger early in the film where the forger's like oh i've never seen this particular kind of card i'm gonna have to try and get one and mm -hmm. that you don't hear about that again until you know an hour and a half later and <laughs> like that was kind of cool and he's um his way of getting his gun past the police cordon was mm. was interesting, but the actual denouement is pretty rushed, and the end is pretty rushed. It's like, yeah, but the, stupid. He rushes in, shoots him with machine gun. Ah, oh, it's over. But it's, it's not only just he just runs and shoots him. Everyone's kind of kind of gets lifted up. It's yeah. Just, ah. Yeah. Second, and then he drops. It's like Wiley Coyote going over a cliff. It was kind of <laughs> ridiculous, and it kind of did kind of rob the film. Like you, you could almost go, "Oh my god, that was ridiculous!" It's like it was almost laughable. Um, <laughs> but I was so glad the film was over uh, yeah. at that point. Yeah, <laughs> I was just like, it "Oh my god!" Long. So, if you are a big fan of Frederick Forsyth, maybe you'll enjoy this. If maybe. you really like seventies films, like Quentin Tarantino and his book. Fucking love film from the seventies, so maybe it's the kind of thing he would enjoy. Um, yeah. That the, the, the pacing of his last film would say yes. Um, it, uh, it's a bit slow though for me, and yeah, you, as you say, it hasn't necessarily aged all that well. Though I like parts of it. Yeah, um, it's it's it does show the difference between filmmaking then and filmmaking now. Mm -hmm. Not yes. that we don't have two and a half films, two and a half hour films now. It just would be two and a half hours of being beaten over the head with action. <laughs> Very true. Shall I uh, spin the wheel for Let's this month? Spin the wheel again. Let me just share the screen so people can tell I'm not cheating. Doo -doo -doo. Can we see that? We can indeed. Uh, let's just go like that. There we go. We Bada bing, we are going back. Yes. Ten years only. What is it that we are seeing? Okay. Is that am I closing that tab now? Close that tab. There we go. I don't know if that's worked or not. I can't see you, but anyway. Um I've just turned it off on my end. We're professional. Uh, 
We're professionals, but I can't see you anymore. I <laughs> can't see. Uh, we are going to get my list up. We are. What a treat! What a treat! <laughs> what what a treat, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and everyone else in between and undecided. You might be like, "How the fuck was this ten years ago?" Then it was. It is 2013's After Earth. Oh fuck you! I hate you. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't pick it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Hey, your video's frozen. Yeah, I can't see you anymore. Um, so can you fill for a second? I'm gonna and try and yeah. fix this, and it might take me a second to come back in. That is uh, absolutely fine. Uh, after. Uh, we it's 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 our fault, ladies and gentlemen. We we call his name too many times. He's the, he is the candy man. M night show mama. In the vanity project of Will and Jaden Smith. Oh, I can't believe this is ten years old, my goodness. There we go. Close that one off. There we go. Travis is oh, back. Do not, do not try and share a tab. Share a different window. That's the. There you go. He's like, crash after... thing leaves Kitai Rage and his father Cipher stranded on Earth a millennium after events forced humanity's escape. With Cipher injured, Kitai must embark on a perilous journey to signal for help. Speaking of shitty M. Night Show films. I was saying, we said his name too many times this episode. <laughs> he will appear. Uh, yeah. um, famously uh, a flop. Um, so I haven't seen this. So there we go. You haven't seen it? No. Oh, you lucky son of a bitch. But it is available for rent. It is not on any streaming service. It's, you can rent it on Apple TV, Amazon Prime, um, and the YouTubes. Uh, is it time? It's time for our favorite segment. It is binge browse burn. Um, what have you been? Three weeks. I assume you've seen something. I have been spending most of my time playing Legend of Zelda: Tears of the Kingdom, which I did talk about last time, but I've had more time to go into it. And my first inclination was to put it in the binge, um, but. Had a bit of a review of it. And this is, I was talking to my gym instructor, Bo, and we were talking about best game of the year. And I think unquestionably, Tears of the Kingdom is going to be in the conversation, if not the obvious front runner, considering the 10 out of 10s across the board, all of the YouTubers and Twitchers are doing it because of that crafting and making flaming penises on big statues and flying things and x wings and all sorts of stuff that they're doing in there in there there is so much customization in that game it is phenomenal but much like my question uh conversation i had with Bo about god of war ragnarok doesn't really do much to actually expand on gaming it doesn't really innovate it's more of breath of the wild with this crafting element to it, which is fantastic, but also very limited if you don't like it. There's more story going through, there's a more of a narrative through line this time, and it's good, but it's more of the same. And if you didn't like Breath of the Wild, you're not gonna like this. So, I'm putting this in Browns. Wow. feels controversial. It does. Um, I love my Zelda games and I love this game and but at the same time, I can very clearly see that this is not a game for everyone. It's doing very well, which is which is fantastic for Nintendo. Um, and I'm glad that many people are enjoying it. But at the same time, it's whilst it is in some ways pushing many, many boundaries of gameplay and what you can do in an open world and stuff, at the same time, if you don't like that kind of game, this there's nothing in this game that you are going to enjoy. Like fighting, it's a bit, it's not a fighting game and the breaking of weapons the damage on them it's it's frustrating you want to just go through and wreck people um so it's not 
it's not something if you want to be an action adventure game it's not really that because there's so much more reliance on puzzles as well which if you like puzzles this is this is a good game but you've got to be good at the action stuff as well and there's there's a lot of bits going on so i put it in browse because if you if you're not going to like if you're not going to enjoy the first hour of this game you're not going to enjoy this game if you didn't like breath of the wild you are not going to enjoy this you will probably look at all of the wonderful little things of people making ridiculous laser turrets and things taking out hinoxes and all sorts of things like that that are in the game and it looks fun and it does and it is but you kind of got to be good at it to be as entertaining and fun as that and getting good at this game that's a full-time job and i don't have that time so jordan's advice on this one is get good get good mate yeah <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um uh, uh, i think i think it's very even handed because i know what a fan you are of a series mm, i i genuinely love it and i love the story that they're weaving and the fact that they are doing some they are improving and they're slowly but surely bringing in more like they got matthew mercer to come in and do the voice of ganondorf um i love his work he's a great voice actor and i'm a huge fan of critical role so two coming together is wonderful but at the same time i can very much see why other people might not like this and i can see why something like diablo 4 which has just come out could be a bit of a it seems strange calling dark um diablo 4 a dark horse for game of the year considering it's diablo 4 and i grew up on the diablo games i love the diablo games that may pip it at the post because it's had much more successful um online launch compared to a lot of other big net big games that came out where they often are just broken um people seem to be really loving it it seems to be expanding on uh the diablo formula but again it's if you don't like diablo you're gonna get into a game that needs 100 hours in it mm, probably not but i am going to get it at some point but i'm gonna wait i'm not a schmuck i'm gonna wait for it to go on sale uh and probably wait to wait to hear a little bit more about the monetization that kind of thing because blizzard uh you know that kind of you know um i would like to move on to our traditional content matter because i mm. <laughs> do a little gaming now and then but uh i am certainly not 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 the level of uh that you have especially not while i was moving mm. and i would like to talk about a new australian series that is on prime video um which is unusual you don't get a whole lot of australian streaming content mm. so this is uh deadlock you might be seeing some if you're a liver in australian if you live you might be seeing some advertising around about it it's mm. a fair bit of publicity uh, a feminist noir comedy set against a bucolic backdrop with a rising body count. So it's created by the Kates, Kate McCartney, Kate McLennan. Uh, overseas audience, you will have no idea who these people are. Nope. Um, but they uh, they had a YouTube series called The Cooking Show, uh, cooking, The Catering Show, uh, which was okay. actually really, really, really fucking funny and very good. And then they did a, a parody of morning television called Get Kraken. Which was also excellent, okay. and so this so this is a massive step up in production quality and and a diff, much different genre in the sense that it says it's a noir comedy. Do okay. you keep put off by the fact that it says it's a feminist noir comedy? Like, and I, for I, I, it, who's trying to search it? It is dead L O C H, like a lock. Okay, yes. lock. Not it is not. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was like, it, why can't I find it? I've seen it um it is if it says it's a feminist noir comedy i mean uh, uh that kind of thing is almost <laughs> to say something like that these days can be almost seen as being a little bit provocative because mm -hmm. well, it's a big feminist and it brings out the fucking incels um <laughs> but, that's a trigger word uh i don't think it's overtly overly you know feminist i mean i think it is a feminist it definitely has that angle but mm -hmm. i don't think it's overbearing in that sense and it's certainly not i think something that puts people off if you mm. like as a guy it's not like i'm sorry someone's gonna hate me for saying this but it's not like wonder woman 84 or captain marvel where mm. it just it, it it reinforces its feminist cred by basically making every man in it fucking horrible mm. in a ridiculous way because 
every man in the show kind of is an idiot or horrible. <laughs> but I, that doesn't in a better way um, for me. I, I don't know. I just don't want to put that, that word to put people off. The word yeah. comedy, I think, is also probably a little generous uh-huh. uh, because I don't think it's very funny. Um, but it is more a murder mystery kind of show. Okay. So the murder mystery is great, and it's keeping it going for me. So he's set in Tasmania uh, and in a small community called Deadlock, L-O-C-H, uh, which has basically gone undergone a bit of transformation in the last 10 years from being a rundown or a, a hollowed-out timber uh, uh, town. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do I call it? Um, anyway, logging. That's it, logging town. To oh, yeah. becoming kind of a very hip sort of uh, destination, very popular with gay women. So mm. everyone in the, a very great proportion of the population of down are now lesbians. And they, it, this is set over a week of a, or a month of a, a, a festival called the Festival, where it's full of like, you know, really pretentious you know, art and, um, and, you know, uh, cooking nights and that kind of thing. <laughs> there, a, there is a, a murder of a well-known local uh-huh. uh which has the small police force is basically not equipped to they do not feel the local fierce force police force is equipped to investigate it so they import a uh, uh a detective from interstate mm. to run the investigation okay uh, our protagonist is dulcy collins played by kate box and she is brilliant in this i i don't think i've seen her in anything else she was in a strange show called Wentworth, which I did not see. Um, uh, but uh, she was also in a series called Rake, which I also hadn't seen. But I think she's fantastic in this. Mm. Um, there's some other familiar faces in there. Tom Ballard, who is a well-known Australian stand-up comedian. Oh, yeah. Um, Nina Oyama. If anybody here has watched the Utopia series on the ABC, it's also, I think, on one of the Netflix maybe in Australia. Uh, if you haven't watched Utopia, this is the Australian show to Utopia, not okay. the British one. Mm. Australian Utopia is fucking great. And Nina Ayam is in that. She's also an Australian stand-up. She's fantastic in this as well. Um, that's the strong points of this show. The, okay. there is a, it, it, the, where it gets weak for me is it's not very funny. Um, and okay. I think that uh, – so I enjoy the murder mystery elements. The parts that are in there to be a comedy – I think a week uh, and or very niche. Mm. Um, And I think the major part of that failing is the role played by Madeline Sammy uh, Mm -hmm. of Eddie Redcliffe, who is the interstate detective brought in to run the the mystery, the detective running the investigation. She is from Darwin. Okay. Uh, And she is insanely over the top Australian, mate. Fuck me, dead cunt, you know, kind of like, and like, it's like, I, I, I do that as a bit of a joke sometimes, but like, on screen, she's also incredibly obnoxious and incompetent. Oh. Um, and basically, her character's just is she doesn't want to be there, so she wants to solve a murder as quickly as possible. And if that means, you know, convicting the wrong person or, you know, wrapping it up the wrong way, so be it. Okay. Uh, even as extra murders keep happening, extra bodies keep turning up. She refuses to countenance the idea that this is a serial killer or all connect- murders are connected. Like, she wants to go home. Mm. So she's obnoxious and incompetent and over the top. The, the acting, the overacting is breathtakingly bad. Like, I'm sure Madeline Sammy is a fantastic actor. I don't know who that is. They are. I've never seen anything they've done before. Um, I have to imagine this is how the character was written. And mm. how the creators, the, the, uh, Kate and Kate, wanted the character to come across. And I feel like that person's there for uh, uh, Eddie Redmayne. I think it's Eddie Redcliffe, sorry. Eddie Redcliffe is Redmayne, <laughs> somebody else. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Redcliffe is a is there for, I think they're there for the laughs. That's where the laughs should come. But yeah. they don't. They're so over the top. It's annoying. It's incredibly annoying. You're like, if you know, the rest of the show wasn't so strong, I would absolutely have turned off after an episode or two. Ow. Go through the IMDb. This has not got a good rating in IMDb. It's got a five and a half, five, seven. Okay. And go through and read the reviews. And this is the kind of thing that's going to set off internet fanboys, so I wouldn't read too much into that. It's pretty decent. But mm. all of the reviews say the same thing. It's, oh, I don't mind it. Uh, you know, this is okay. It's not too bad. Kate Box is good. 
But my God, the Darwin detective is terrible. Madeline Sammy's terrible. Eddie is terrible. Ed is, they are one of the most dislikable characters I've seen <laughs> on a television show for a very, very long time. Probably maybe since Skylar in Breaking Bad. But at least um, uh, that, that character was well acted. Uh, so this is really like, I'm going to put this in the browse category. I am going to keep watching because I like Australian TV. I like supporting local content, but my God. <laughs> I'm it's, laughing uh, at you're saying and I'm laughing because my studio audience is now really trying not to laugh at the fact that she sneezed and is really embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> That's how professional we are here, people. We have a live <laughs> studio audience. Um, uh, so I would say if you're – I would not be surprised if this turns uh, – maybe this is available in, in overseas territories. I think it was made for Prime. Um, if you're a borrower, if you're not like a straight – sort of thing that kind of – that kind of thing is sounds like this the the type of project that would be translated to sort of like ah oh, that would totally work if we suddenly got some uh, like a cop from Florida in Pennsylvania or something like that just complete fish out of water sort of thing yeah I, it, I, it, I could, it, it, and it, I think it will translate to overseas it's beautiful but, but where it's shot I, I'm assuming it's shot in Tassie. Mm. Every time we watch it, we're like, oh, I can't, I can't wait to go back to Tassie again. I love it down there. And <laughs> you sort of look at it and go, oh, I could see myself living somewhere like that. Mm. Um, so the, the actual, it's, it's really beautifully shot. The locations are beautiful. Uh, it's just like you got this, like, it's like, I don't know if you've ever traveled anywhere with like a really obnoxious, loud American tourist on the bus with you. Mm. Um, <sighs> you know. And that's what that's what uh, Eddie Redcliffe, Madeline Sammy's character is. They're uh, so annoying. You're like, it, I just you just kill them off halfway through, please. They're horrible. But is, is it? There's there's no endearing qualities because what I'm getting from that is a, a little bit like John Candy's character in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, but just without the John Candy charm. John, exactly. That was what John Candy could do. He could play a super obnoxious character, but lovable at the same time. Yeah. Matt, Eddie is not lovable. There's no redeeming characteristics whatsoever. So far, we are three episodes in. Okay. So is, I, is it a weekly drop? It is. I think the next episode drops on Friday, maybe. Okay. Um, they dropped the first three episodes at once. Uh -huh. um, so, um, and you sort of get the sense at the end of a third episode that maybe Eddie's come around to the idea that, yes, this is, you know, a serial killer and they are all connected. Mm. So maybe they're coming around a little bit and maybe they'll improve throughout the series. Mm -hmm. But the first three episodes, my Lord, the most obnoxious character I can remember in such a long time <laughs> that almost destroyed the series. So, oh. um, wow. What an interesting choice. But anyway, it's there. If you've got Prime, it's on it. So, you know, you're already paying for it. It's there. <laughs> Now, the last one that I'm going to talk about is a burn. And this is somewhat controversial in certain circles. This is something that you will probably not know about and not care about. Um, this is a anime from 1997 to 1998 of a seemingly beloved um, manga series it's called Berserk. And Berserk follows Guts, a skilled swordsman who, for, who joins forces with a mercenary group called the Band of the Hawk, led by the charismatic Griffin, and fights with them as they battle their way into the royal court. And this is one that, having worked in EB Games, and having had many people talk to me about so many of their passion thing, TV shows, movies, collectors, and all of that sort of stuff, this was one that came up a lot. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. And the animation style is quintessential, sort of like 80s, early 90s style of, if you think of manga, um, movies and things from from the uh, from the eighties and nineties that you get on a VHS tape because randomly somehow it it got it turned up in your local um, blockbuster because it was on a wrong shipment from Japan. Um, it's that kind of animation. The animation is 
not particularly attractive when you think about the what was happening in the animation circles during 97 and 98. This was the time prime global launch, uh, of, you know, announcements of um, Studio Ghibli with Princess Mononoke, um, as well as this was going through a bit of a renaissance for Disney with their um, the stuff that they were producing. There's nothing special about it here. And I've heard people talking saying, oh, it's fantastic. I don't get what the hell's going on with the story. Guts is an idiot. Um, but he's he's almost the quintessential Dungeons and Dragons dumb barbarian who, no matter how much he gets hurt and damaged, he just keeps on coming. And his strength is that maybe he's too stupid to realize he's he's like a serious version of the Black Knight from Monty Python. His <laughs> butter scratch, <laughs> and he just keeps on going. And there's, we're supposed to kind of care. Like, there's nothing about this character that I care about. And there's this weird thing with some kind of monster thing that seems to be growing, like a seed thing. I don't know. Um, I've I, I got five episodes in, and they're they're short episodes. Um, 22 minutes, 23 minutes long. And it's like, I, I, I've watched five. I've watched over an hour's worth of this and I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I don't know why people like it. I don't get it. Maybe the manga is really amazing in a different way. Maybe it's a really visceral style. But... I, I this don't get you. it. This, yeah. is, this is a burn for me. This is a burn. And it, I, I feel bad because I don't talk about anime often. And when I, when I do, I want to love it. I love my animation. But this is just, this is bad. This is not good. There's no redeeming qualities. The voice acting is poor. The sound effects are cheap. The animation is middling at best. The story is a muddle. Oh, no, I want that time back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather watch anything else or almost anything. I don't want to watch After Earth. <laughs> now them's the breaks. <laughs> the wheel has spoken. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing. The wheel has spoken. <clears throat> but that's it. That's that's all I really wanted to talk about this time. Um we may have a little bit more to talk about for um, video games over the, ne uh, the next time we do the show because there's coming up, there's an Xbox showcase, which is apparently going to have a big deep dive of gameplay of um, Bethesda's new release, Starfield. So I'm curious about it. We'll see if Bethesda can actually finally update their model from Skyrim eventually. That'd be stupid. I know. <laughs> Well, I got, well, I got two more that I want to cover off very quickly. Um, two season finales. Uh, one okay. uh, was probably a little more hyped than the other one since Succession finished last week. Oh, that's right. Uh, now, I watched the whole of the last season, uh, and in fairness, I put up my hand. I hadn't seen the pre most of the previous three seasons because I just didn't, t didn't grab me when it first came out, and I couldn't be asked going back and watching the whole thing. So I just watched the YouTube recap about the first three seasons and, and went from there. Um, the finale was pretty well received across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, most people really, really thought it was fantastic and one of the better finales of all time. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of stuck the landing. Um, I, I think the real weakness here for me, I'm putting this in the light binge category in mm -hmm. the sense it's really great TV. It's beautifully written. The acting's exceptional. The production yeah. values are amazing. It's beautifully shot. Um, and the story itself is is reasonably compelling. If I'd watched three seasons of this, I think I might have really loved, fallen in love mm -hmm. with what happened in the last episode. But mm -hmm. there were sort of call outs and references to things that happened in the first three seasons that I know about because I watched the YouTube recap. Mm -hmm. But I didn't watch it. So, you know what I mean? Like, you haven't had that emotional connection yeah. really with what's happened because you haven't been on board the whole time. You're kind of a Johnny come lately. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had a criticism. Watch all the other ones as, as, uh, as your own flashback. <laughs> if, if, if i had a criticism it would be that it was a little predictable uh, in, in the sense that like it didn't surprise me or wow me or make me go 
Mm. Oh, I didn't see that coming. And then, here I am asking for a twist after identity. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't exactly asking. The session has generally been good about is kind of subverting your expectations and keeping you more on the edge of your seats. I don't know that that's really been what the show's known for, frankly. I, I, I don't know that that's what its strength is. So it probably shouldn't have been. I mean, again, I've watched, I don't know, what, eight, seasons, eight episodes in the last season. That was what I've, what I've seen. Mm. So I don't want to say it's bad. I, and it's not a criticism in, in so much as like that. It, it kind of really signposted this along the way. Okay. That it was going to end the way it did. Um, but if you've been holding off like I did because you watched one episode and you thought, mm, eh, this is a show about horrible people. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to persist and try and really start to, if you can motor through a few, a few episodes in season one, mm -hmm. uh, by the last, by the last ep season, it's really, it's a humming machine. And, and even uh, if only for the performances, uh, it's worth a look. Uh, and I think it does a pretty good job of sticking the landing. Like I don't know, you know, it, that it could have done it much better without actually also alienating a good portion of their audience um okay and they've they remain horrible people and that and that doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing it makes you kind of sometimes go they're billionaires now and they're billionaires later i don't fucking care but like uh. the, the the it is very tense and, and you can't you know the way it all plays out in the end is is as it is i don't want to spoil it for people but i would recommend succession as a as, a, as one of the better series who've come out in the last few years Okay. The other, the other show that finished, and again, I only watched the last season of it because I never really found time to watch it before. And that is the Marvels Mrs. Maisel, which oh, um, yes. much, much lauded, available I think in mm. Prime in Australia. I can't yeah. talk about that overseas. Um, follows the up and coming career of uh, a female stand up comedian in the fifties or sixties. Um, it's supposed to be, um, uh, like a an allegory for uh, what's her face? Um, famous um, Joan Rivers, you know, huh? Joan Rivers. Yes, yes. I don't know. I I honestly have no idea if that was the intent behind it or not. After her husband leaves, her young mother of two, Mar Miriam Midge Maisel, discovers she's a talent for stand-up comedy. Could this be her calling? So it's really a two-part. I mean, I watched the last season. Like I said, I can't speak about the first few seasons. I kind of had to get Mich Michelle to tell me who these people were and what was going on because um, I, I didn't even get around to watching a, a catch-up. But jumping straight into season, the last season, um, uh -huh. wow, this, season five, it's so beautifully written. This is one of the best-written TV shows I've come across in recent years. I would say, for me personally, and it's just my call, I would sit down and watch this before I would watch Succession. So this is a binge for me. Mm. Um, the the real money, the real meat and the bone here is between uh, the main characters, Rachel Brosnahan playing Midge Maisel and mm -hmm. Alex Borstein playing her agent, Susie Myerson. If you mm -hmm. don't know the name Alex Borstein, you absolutely know the voice because yep. she does Lois on Family Guy and probably uh, a multitude of other different voices. But every time I hear her speak, she's like, oh, my God, it's Lois. Lois. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so those two, there's also some other thing, you know, Sony Shalhoub, uh, Kevin mm. Pollack in there, a few other people in there, you'll recognize Jane Lynch. Um, but it's, it's these two, these two characters are a real heart and soul of a show. And, mm -hmm. they, and, and seeing Midge struggle to get ahead as a woman in that time period, uh, despite her undeniable ability and talent, mm. it's, a, it's very entertaining. Again, does it end in a particularly unusual, unpredictable way? It doesn't, but I found this one more enjoyable to watch. Okay. At the very least. The last season, at least, takes a fairly different path to maybe Succession, where Succession plays it with a fairly straight bat. Um, Succession kind of is each at the, each episode of the last season is a day in the lives of these characters over the, you know, okay. uh, uh, I think we talked about it. I think it's okay to spoil now, but. Brian Cox's character passes away early in the season, and each day, each um each episode is a day after that. So it's kind yeah. of how that season progresses. Where the marvelous Mrs. Nasal kind of flashes back and flashes forward a few different ways. There's a couple of times you're like, "Huh? How is this like the second or third last episode? Why are they telling us this story now? Like when you've got to you've got to wrap the whole show up in a couple of hours from now, show wise." But 
and it, it really fits together very nicely once you see the whole assembly of the last episode so it's last season so i will finish it there to say two excellent binge suggestions i would put the marvelous mrs mazel slightly about succession for me just okay it's easier to watch but if you've not watched either of them my goodness you have a treat waiting for you okay the last one that i will quickly finish off is one that i had forgotten that i'd actually <laughs> kept up with which is kind of informative silo ah yes yes yeah. It's still going, still doing its thing. It's still fine, but I've heard people say it's fantastic, but I'm like, nah, I struggled with it. Yeah, I'm, like I, I genuinely forgot that I was up to date on that, and it's like, oh, oh yeah, huh? Don't care. <laughs> that says a lot. So this is in the that's, that's browse. That's, that's it. It's 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 browse because it's it's there. If if you've got Apple. It's there, but there's better TV shows. There's more engaging TV shows. I mean, it's nice to have a, a prelude to whatever the Fallout TV show is going to be. Maybe. But I kind of... I don't want Fallout to be just a straight, straight-laced straight show. I, it's got to have a bit of stupidity in it. Mm -hmm. It's got to. It can't, it can't be all, all straight all the time. But... Anyway, that was the last one. There's like, okay. It doesn't sound like I'm missing a lot. No, you're not. I mean, everyone's fine in it. Everything's chugging along fine, but it's just not. I'm not invested. It's like, oh, okay. Yep. You've worked out the formula on how to make a streaming show look the part. Get a couple of recognizable names in it and keep the story generally going in the right direction. But are you actually doing or saying anything engaging with that time no and the episodes are long they're 50 minutes so this has an 87 audio a critic score and an 87 audience score on rotten tomatoes wow but, um uh people like this show i guess i guess so i guess so but you know that more power to them. enjoyable it's not a bad show at all it's just not doing anything for me and this is the sort of show that i should like really a lot a lot of it is going on but that kind of brings us to the end of the show i think ladies and gentlemen anything yes. any last things that you wanted to no i think that's that's that is a good way to end it mm. i will put a little bit of a public safety warning out there for you ladies and gentlemen now this is something that i have not prepped my co-host for Netflix has released the first official um, deluge of images from Zack Schneider's Rebel Moon Part 1. Please, please, please remember, ladies and gentlemen, that Zack Schneider is very good at making something look pretty, particularly if it's a still. Take that with a hefty grain of salt. That does not mean that it is going to be fantastic. Wait until the trailer and even then, keep waiting, because he can generally make good trailers too, because what's that all about? Not actually telling a story, but just presenting what things look like. This is heavily caution, ladies and gentlemen, heavily caution. Public service go, announcement done. Go easy on us, fanboys. Yeah. No, I want to hear from you. Come on. Show Is me. This, wasn't this supposed to be like a Star Wars film that they said, no, thank you? Basically, I think, yes. And then Netflix came in and went, all right, here's money, make it. And he, in typical Zack Schneider, went, oh, I don't have enough time in one movie. I need to do another one. So here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Disney, Lucasfilm said, no, this isn't good enough for a Star Wars sequel. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and the return of skywalker or whatever that fucking thing was called was better than this according to disney that's everything you need to know and this is just further further proof that zack snyder should not be a director he should be a director of photography and get someone else to write his stuff and he just films it makes it look pretty because he's not very good at telling the story and he can't do it in a normal length nothing he he apparently he's going to be doing multiple versions of this 
This is on Netflix. There's going to be two versions of the same damn movie, and one of them is going to be two and a half hours long, and then there's going to be the Snyder Cut, which is going to be 17 days long. And then you're going to have another eight months before part two comes out, and then he's going to announce, just as that comes out, it's going to be part three, because there's too much in part two. (sighs) Done. Rant done. Very good. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for putting up their rants. Sorry for the long delay. We'll be back in two weeks. Yes, in two weeks. We will continue with our chain movie of the week, which I'm sorry, it, which is, is Con Air. And I'm so excited. This is going to be so much fun. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we have got the new the, the movie Wheel of Wonder, which is <laughs> the 10-year-old M. Night Shyamalan, Will Smith, Jason Smith movie After Earth. And third movie to be determined could be a cinema release movie. Could be. I would suggest at this point in time it should be Renfield. I think yes, maybe we should do Renfield. Yes, sounds like a good plan. There you go. You have the full schedule, and of course, binge browse burn will be back, and we will be talking all the things to stay away from and consume as well. It means next time is a triple, double, double dose of Nicholas Cage. Welcome to the Cage Cast. <laughs> this is so, I am so excited for this. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. Please remember to like, share, subscribe on all the platforms that I talked about at the beginning of the show. If you have any recommendations for movies, TV shows, video games, books, or anything at all let us know on any of those streaming services any of those platforms you can reach out to us and we would love to hear from you until next time good night good night